Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to you, Jeffrey Zilks, Tony Glass, Peter Bohack, and David G. On this episode of DTNS, Sarah sits in judgment over three AI stories from Google. Are they worth your attention? Plus, the autonomous cars, are they finally here yet? Mm, closer? And why the RIAA suing, in this case, is a good thing. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, June 25th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And from North of the Wall, I'm Anthony Lemos. You are literally north of the, 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 yeah, the ice and the snow. You come yeah. from the land of the ice and snow. Yeah. You might say. Uh, hey, sure. everybody. Uh, <laughs> I think we... they have fire up there, too. Do you? So uh, I'm from I'm in the land of ice and fire? We did have a fire yesterday. The lightning storm, our, our annual lightning storm came through and, and started a fire in Willow yesterday. So. Well, there you go. See? Exactly. Land of the ice exactly what Sarah's trying ice, to say. Ice and fire. Yep. You right. should work on a song about that while we do the quick hits. The European Commission has said it looks as if Microsoft's bundling of Teams is a violation of EU antitrust laws. Microsoft removed Teams from its Microsoft 365 and Office 365 bundles, making it a separate app worldwide, as well as trying to improve interoperability with Zoom and Slack. But the commission says these changes are insufficient. The commission also says you don't really get a choice as a consumer, even though Teams is a separate app, and that there are still too many interoperability limitations. Microsoft President Brad Smith told the Financial Times that the company will work to find solutions to address the commission's remaining concerns. Speaking of Microsoft, the Surface reviews are out for the Surface laptop that was announced. Uh, here's what I noticed looking around at the reviews. Laptop Magazine uh, found it crushed on the Geekbench 6 test, handily beating Intel Meteor Lake and the MacBook Pros. Uh, but it lagged behind the Mac on video conversion and kind of behind everything in gaming. Uh, that's all down to the Snapdragon Elite X processor, which lots of other Copilot Plus PCs have as well. But it looks like it does pretty well in the Surface. Uh, and the Surface is great battery life. Uh, so good for general use, good for AI processing, maybe not so great uh, for video editing and definitely not that great for gaming. PC Mag liked all of that as well as the build quality of the metal frame and the haptic feedback of the touchpad. However, they noted it was somewhat expensive compared to similarly configured competing PCs and noted that the Windows app compatibility with the ARM CPU is still a little shaky. Still, The Verge's Tom Warren felt that it had great performance for most apps, as long as they were working, and noted the 16 gigabytes of RAM in the base model is a nice spec bump for a $999 laptop. If you're a keyboard enthusiast, and I know many of you are, you might like Logitech's new low-profile G515 or 515 Lightspeed TKL wireless keyboard. The switches are compatible with Cherry MX-style keycaps for easier customization. 120 hours of battery life with RGB off, 36 hours with it on at full brightness. The Logitech G515 keyboard is available now for $139. Would you like an e-ink reader that can access books from multiple companies like Kobo and Amazon and more? Maybe work as a voice recorder or your music player and a bunch of other stuff? Let me introduce you to the book... Books Palma, B-O-O-X, the Books Palma uh, is a 6.1 inch e-ink screen, but runs Android with the Google Play Store on it. So you can technically download TikTok. It's not going to work very well because there's no refresh rate, but there are plenty of apps that will work on that e-ink screen, like the Kindle app, the Kobo app, Readwise Reader, uh, The Verge points that one out, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Audible, even Flipboard. Uh, you can run email, you can run Slack. The Books Palma is available right now for 280 bucks. Reuters sources say that Foxconn verbally told third-party recruiters in India not to hire married women for its Indian assembly plant. You might say, why not? Well, apparently Foxconn believed that women might have higher absenteeism because of family responsibilities and that their jewelry might interfere with production. This would be a violation of both Apple and Foxconn's policies, obviously. Apple also said it took action back in 2022 to conduct audits and that all of its suppliers in India, in fact, hire married women. 
Foxconn says 25% of the women that it hired in its latest round were married, though it didn't say what that actual number was. A former Foxconn employee told Reuters that prohibition is relaxed sometimes, especially during high production periods or other times of labor shortages. Yeah, it sounds like it's an informal wink-wink kind of thing that's, that's going on, but, you know, maybe it'll stop now. All right, Sarah, a lot of people in our audience say they're tired of AI stories, but I still feel like some of them are worth bringing to folks' attention if we're going to responsibly cover all the tech news. Uh, so I would like to ask you to sit in judgment. Do you do you feel comfortable sitting in judgment, Sarah? Yeah, that's all I do all day. Okay, so, good. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, ready to uh, judge. We have three Google-related AI stories. Uh, so you are going to judge if they are worth people's attention or not. Okay. I'm, are I'm you ready? game. I, I don't have a gavel handy, but um, okay. I do. I wish I could get it to you. If fast you throw enough. it hard enough, I think it'll go through the screen. No. Nope. No. Nope. No. Nope. Nope. All right. Uh, arm. Case number one. Okay. The Gemini side panel is rolling out to all workspace users. So you can get it in Gmail, Google Drive, Docs, Sheets, Slides, etc. This is the one that can help you write and edit your content. Uh, generate slides, modify spreadsheets. Uh, if you have access, you will see a little sparkle icon, the Gemini sparkle, next to your profile avatar. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, I don't have a sparkle next to mine, and that's Me annoying. Either. You um, got to pay for it. If you pay for workspace, you get it. I pay for workspace. Um, oh, anyway. You uh, still don't have the sparkle. Okay. I don't have the sparkle. I mean, unless I'm doing something wrong, I don't know if I have to like log out and log back in. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Google Docs is something that I don't use everything that is available within Google Docs, but it is something that I use on a daily basis. Um, I, I've said on the show before, I'm constantly like looking for reasons that would make AI work better for me. Uh, and uh, that it, that's a place that I'm hanging out a lot. I know a lot of people uh, use docs as well, you know, for stuff like slideshows and, you know, maybe you're just doing a lot of writing uh, within within a document, spreadsheet stuff. Uh, I mean, Daily Tech News Show is made within a Google Stock, a Docs spreadsheet every single day. So yeah, I think that is an AI story that is is worth our time. Hear, hear. <laughs> so you find it not guilty of wasting our time. Correct. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, case number two of three, uh, the case of Google Project Zero and Project Naptime. Great name. Uh, Project Naptime automates some of the more tedious and mechanical parts of vulnerability research. Google's Project Zero is a, a security team. It includes a code browser, a Python tool. The Python tool can run scripts in a sandbox for you, a debugger tool that observes programs' reactions to different inputs, and a reporter tool that monitors task progress and verifies successful conditions. So all this stuff that you would normally have to do manually, like let me try a bunch of different inputs, let me look through the code, let me do a debugger run, this can automate it. On the Cyber Eval 2 benchmark, Project Naptime showed significant improvements in identifying things like buffer overflow, advanced memory corruption flaws in C and C++. Judge Lane, how do you rule? I rule that, well, okay, so Judge Lane has never worked in vulnerability research. In fact, um, when I was first looking up this story, I was like, we're talking about like code, right? Because <laughs> Project Naptime threw me off a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm like, is it about, you know, the brains that are tired? Well, I guess it is. Uh, it, yeah. It, I mean, the name is like you can take a nap while the automation does all this, the boring stuff. Right, right, right. right. Uh, so, yes, this I think that and people who do work in this line of research, you know, let me know if Judge Lane is wrong here. But I'm going to guess that the tedious parts of the job that, you know, keep you up all night and uh, don't let you take a nap on Saturday afternoon or any time that you want to take one, uh, you would welcome something like this. Obviously, it has to work well. Yeah, but right. I think that this is, yeah, this 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 is an AI story worth our time. Here, here. I have ruled. Fantastic. Yeah, I will, I will concur, even though I'm not a judge. Because, uh, yeah, this is the kind of, like, really mechanical stuff that, it can, it, it's easier to make sure an LLM doesn't get wrong, right? It's like, just go through this kind of thing. Crank, crank, crank. Love yeah. that. 
All right. We have two not guilty of wasting your time stories so far. Here is case number three. The information reports that its sources say that Google is developing chatbots based on celebrities, including YouTube stars, a.k.a. influencers. The idea is to create partnerships that let celebrities create their own chatbots of themselves. Uh, this is similar to character.ai, which we played around with on DTNS before. And if you uh, know Meta has been doing this, like there's a Snoop Dogg chatbot that he runs, etc. Well, okay. Um... <sighs> I'm not going to say <laughs> that celebrities uh, creating chatbots, and I've not played around with the Snoop Dogg chatbot uh, recently at all, so I don't know. Maybe it's really, really amazing. But this does feel, it feels gimmicky. Um, a YouTube star, a celebrity, an influencer, that kind of all is the same thing to me at this point. I mean, maybe not every YouTube star is considered a celebrity because celebrities are more sort of like old school Hollywood, but just sort of assuming that this is somebody that you uh, look up to slash admire or even sort of like hate follow, just somebody that's really, really, really popular and is going to get a lot of attention. What's, what's the chat bot for? What's it for? Um, entertainment? I mean, I guess it just, it's sort of like, yeah, if you've, if you're the sort of person who's going to get a bunch of people to at least play around with that for a bit, okay. But no, I don't know. This just, it feels kind of meh to me. So I'm sorry. Uh, you do not uh, collect 200 or pass go. Go directly oh, no. to jail. You are guilty of wasting our time That's story. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. Sentencing uh, to follow. <laughs> yes, but stay tuned next time. Stay tuned for our Saturday episode where we sentence you to <laughs> whatever. Uh, uh, okay, well, there you go. Two of three, not bad uh, in, in our AI coverage today. Uh, let us know what you think of our new approach to AI coverage. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Yeah, we know that there are a lot of AI stories out there. And, you know, we, we try to bring the ones to you that we, we think are, are worth your time. Uh, what also might be worth your time is not driving. Waymo has dropped the wait list in San Francisco for anybody who's interested in taking a driverless ride, opening up its robo-taxi service to everybody. Previously, you sign up, there's an app, you get put on a wait list. Some people got through, some people didn't. In San Francisco, everybody, fair game. So let me walk you through a little bit of a timeline here. Back in 2020, Waymo started operating robo-taxi service in Phoenix, Arizona, open to the public. In August of 2021... Waymo started uh, its own commercial test in San Francisco, but only to certain testers. They were called trusted testers. Some of those riders had been pre-approved for various reasons. In some cases, they had to sign non-disclosure agreements to, you know, not tell company secrets type thing. In March of 2022, Waymo started offering driverless rides to its own staff and started the waitlist for the public. This was in San Francisco. The company said approximately 300,000 people have since signed up since it first, first launched. And then in June of 2024, as we sit here today, anybody in San Francisco who downloads the app and requests a ride can get one. Now, this doesn't apply to Los Angeles, where I and Tom live, but I, and I've, I've, mentioned this before on a on a previous gdi it was like because i've lived here for just over six months now and i had never seen a waymo car uh because i didn't live in san francisco or phoenix and we talked to, we talked about waymo quite a bit there's good and bad there's good and bad uh press that's coming out of driverless cars in general waymo not a stranger to that and one day i saw one on the street and I was like, oh, my God, wow, you lad, no one's driving that car. <laughs> yeah, you know? I always want to wave at it. Like, yeah, I don't even know though why. there's no one there to return Yeah, I want to wave, wave yeah. at the fact that, yeah, like, I, I see it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I saw another one. I was like, oh, wow, another one. And then the next day it was like, oh, I saw three today. And oh. now it's like anytime I'm out and about <laughs> doing errands, there are way more cars around me doing all sorts of, you know, you know, I'm not, I'm not always going just, you know, up and down one street either. Sometimes it's the freeway. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a Waymo car is passing another car and I'm like, <laughs> accelerating car, <laughs> no one in car, <laughs> you know, it's going to take some getting used to, but, uh, at least in my area of town, there's definitely a Waymo test going on here. 
Are you? Would you say they're way more than you expected? Mm, yeah, I would. Yeah. Never, is is um, that what the name is supposed to be? I don't. Like, I don't way know. Way more time for naps. Yeah, way more better than other things that yeah. you could do. Yeah. I think it is ironic. I, I think this is the definition of irony, possibly. Yeah, maybe not. But uh, I think it's funny. Then let me say that I have been taken off the Waymo uh, wait list in Los Angeles, and yet I it have not. It by does the way. not operate in my house in my area. Uh, Sarah is in a part of Los Angeles where it does operate, obviously. Uh, she has not been taken off the wait list. <laughs> however, however, I will say, and I, I don't know for absolute sure, because again, sometimes I, you know, I just kind of see one, you know, I, I don't get like the closest look inside the car. I don't believe I've ever seen it driv- driving a person sitting in the backseat. You've never seen a passenger. Oh, that's interesting. Not you just that see I, it tooling not around. Not that I know of. So, I, and yeah. I could be wrong, but it feels like, especially because they just weren't around and all of a sudden they were just everywhere. It seems like for a city the size of Los Angeles, which is very, it's large and sprawling, that you would, uh, because when did Waymo started in, it was like a certain area of West Hollywood, I think, and Beverly Hills at the beginning. It was a very small test. And it seems like where I live now, which is not that far away from either of those places, but definitely a separate neighborhood, it's like it's it's mapping out my area. And and funnily, I have not seen it do anything weird. There was the one passing of the other car where I was like, well, that's bold, Waymo. But, you know, that's what human drivers do when somebody in front of you is going slow. Uh, I did see there was a right turn. It wasn't a left turn, but it was a right turn where it didn't, the car didn't go into the bike lane. Um, so it took a funny wide right turn. And the mm, bike lane mm-hmm. was quite, quite, you know, deep. And I just know this because I got this wrong on my driver's test way back in the uh, day that if no one's in the bike lane, you pull into the bike lane so that you can, you know, kind of get out of the way for the person the who's going straight it, it, behind you. And Waymo car didn't do that. And I thought, yeah, that's probably just a safety thing. A or maybe yeah. something that the car is going to get better at. Yeah. Maybe it just doesn't know that it, it, that it's supposed to do that. Um, right. The L.A. service area is along the 10 basically, uh, from Santa Monica to downtown and then up from Culver city into Beverly Hills and West Hollywood. Uh huh. So well, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm not far off the 10. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm on, I'm on the route. Yeah. And, uh, it does, doesn't come up here. So I'm going to do a funny video at some point, maybe hopefully where I take uh, a car and a train to the service area in order to catch a Waymo to Sarah's house. <laughs> and and I will know this, and so I will from my yeah. side. We'll we'll make a real cool music video or something. Yeah, you know, something like of that. Of Tom arriving yeah. in the Waymo. Yeah. So a- anyway, yeah, it doesn't seem like a lot of people are riding in this. The wait list being lifted in San Francisco and now Phoenix is is a big advance, but that's still just two cities and limited service areas in both those cities. What is interesting is that this comes at the same time that Uber Freight just announced a long term partnership with Aurora. Uh, Aurora is an autonomous trucking company Mm. that was doing a three-year pilot with Uber Freight, uh, and apparently it went well. So between Dallas and uh, Houston, they will have uh, about 20 autonomous trucks on the road by the end of this year, and they'll rent them out to companies who want to use them to to haul their freight. So we're inching forward. We're inching forward with this stuff. Inching forward. And I know that there are a lot of folks who are just weirded out by this altogether, or just be like, I'm not getting in the back of that car. I cannot wait. I, I mean, I, I, it's not that I don't want anything to go wrong. I want it to go well, but I, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready. Take me off the wait list. Wait a minute. Indeed. Uh, well, folks, if you like Android news and you're like, you know, uh, that Google stuff wasn't exactly Android. Where's the Android news? Uh, let me tell you where it is. It's on Android Faithful. I mean, we cover it here, too, a lot. But every week, Android aficionados Ron Richards, Juan Tue Dao, Michelle Rahman, and Jason Howell bring you the latest Android news and information. Get it in your life. Go to YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show and watch it live Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, or just subscribe to the feed and enjoy it whenever you want at AndroidFaithful.com. 
Well, the Recording Industry Agency, uh, the RIAA, has filed a lawsuit in Boston against the company Suno and in New York against the company Udio. Uh, Suno and Udio are both services that let you describe a song with a text, uh, with text, you know, with a little prompt, and then it creates the entire song. If you want, it'll even create the lyrics. Suno is known for partnering with Microsoft. You can actually call the Suno features from Copilot. Udio probably is most famous for being involved in the making of the parody diss track BBL Drizzy, which Drake then later uh, sampled in a subsequent diss track. Uh, see yesterday's GDI for, for more on the context of all that. Uh, the RIAA aim, claims that both companies used copyrighted works in training their models without permission and that their sole purpose is to create songs that undermine legitimate artist marketplaces. I think that's overstating it. I think it's possible it could undermine marketplaces. I don't think that's the main focus. But the RIA said in its complaint, the use here is far from transformative, as there is no functional purpose for the AI model to ingest the copyrighted recordings other than to spit out new competing music files. Well, um, have that- you heard BBL Drizzy? All right. <laughs> it's a real banger. Uh, having made a Pokemon song for my niece that it was in no way related to anything else I've ever heard uh, on Udio, that's not true. There, there, there are plenty of functional purposes that training the model to know what music is, even if it was based on copyrighted stuff, uh, you know, w- would be useful. But, you know, maybe they'll make their argument of like, but you could have used non-copyrighted music to do that. And maybe that's where they're going. Uh The RIAA was able to make the model put out some almost exact clones of ABBA's Dancing Queen and Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good, among others. Uh, Suno and Udio both point out that they have filters that stop you from directly asking for a copy of a known artist. Uh, I did that. I was like, make this in the style of Taylor Swift. And it was like, we can't do that. Uh, but you could use these keywords and then it suggests, you know, like female right. vocalist, songwriter, pop, blah, 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 blah. And then sure. you get something that kind of mm-hmm. sounds like Taylor Swift. So no, they block you, but yeah, you can kind of make it do it. The RIAA wants compensation of $150,000 per work that was infringed, which would be quite a lot of money because they're claiming pretty much everything was infringed that they, that was ever made. Um, Sarah, let's listen. Let's start with one of the RIAA's example. This is Prancing Queen, the one that they say is pretty much just Dancing Queen. Doesn't sound like Dancing Queen at all. Is that the right one? That can't be the right one. Here, let let me try this again. Oh, there we go. This is better. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, the, this is the actual lyrics. But they were able to make the model generate those lyrics. That's their point. Yeah, that's, that's, I can, I can see where, where All right. any copyright holder would be like, a little too far here. A little too Let's far. try the Johnny B. Good one. I mean, that's the song. That is the song Deep Down in Louisiana, Close to New Orleans, because it reaches the character count, I guess. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. So I, I get their point. Yeah. I do. I get their so, point. But those aren't exact copies. They are, they sound like cover bands, like they tribute do. bands, right? Right. Like yeah. they're close. You're right. But. I don't know that I would hear that and and not go like, wait, that doesn't sound exactly like Chuck Berry. Also, okay, so speaking of cover bands, let's say I go down to the local watering hole. There's a there's a band. They're doing old, you know, 1950, 1950s music. Johnny B. Good comes comes on. I record that performance, put it up on YouTube, and get like ten views. Mm-hmm. Nothing happens. Nothing would happen. If I got a million views, all of a sudden we've got a problem. Yeah. So that's, I think, where a lot of this is coming into play here. That BBL Drizzy track, as I understand it, (laughs) it's a very convoluted story at this point. I know. But, you know, that was something that was created with Udio, then, uh, you know, sort sort of took off on its own. 
And very silly, but, you know, it existed. And then Drake, who it was supposedly making fun of, kind of took it back and used it in a song of his own, kind of to just be like, I'm in on the joke, you know, and, you know, jokes on you type thing. Well, he's one of the biggest artists in the world. So that's going to get something like this a lot more attention than, you know, if he hadn't participated. Yeah, and th- and this lawsuit comes along uh, with the New York Times uh, suing OpenAI, a bunch of uh, film script writers, TV script writers uh, suing OpenAI and others. Uh, there's a big fight, and there are dozens of lawsuits from major names, Sarah Silverman's inv- involved in one too, uh, that are saying, we don't really care what the output is. You used our work to train your model without our permission. And we think that is an infringement. That's what the RIA is saying here too. They're saying this is not a fair use. Uh, Now they're trying to say that the only function of these models is to make copies of their songs. I don't think most people are going to spend the time to put in the prompt to make the song deep down in Louisiana close to New Oral only so they can not have to buy Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good or stream it on Spotify. That just doesn't make sense to me. But I do think it's fair that they are saying, is it right? Is it a fair use to use our copyrighted works to train your model to be able to sound in, in any way like anything? Like, forget whether they're making copies. I think you have a strong argument that, like, you used our work without our permission. Current copyright law just really doesn't contemplate this use case. And I think that's why it's a good thing, even though I fully disagree with everything in their claim, I think it's a good thing that the RIA brought this suit because it is going to accelerate the ability for the Supreme Court to weigh in on this and probably multiple cases like it and say, here's what we think is true now based on current law and point the way for Congress to make legislation, which it should, that says, okay, uh, this is what the court said the law says now. Here's how we think it should work. Uh, you know, maybe you need permission. Maybe there needs to be royalties, whatever it is. But we need something new to address this. Yeah. 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 I mean, listen, open AI making deals with uh, uh, news publications, not unlike something that some artists, not all, but some artists on the music side of this would also be amenable to. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's if there's some sort of an agreement beforehand about, OK, this is something that's going to go into the model and this is what you're going to get. Or maybe, you know, there's some sort of parameter that could be measured <laughs> that would say, like, yeah, Taylor Swift song. So she gets a little cut of this kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know that there are that many of us making this stuff. Maybe I'm naive as to where this is more... But more I'm than with kind you. Of a like, I, I don't think this is threatening the marketplace for actual no. music at this yeah. point. I mean, I made, um, I made, like you said, you made for your niece. Like, I've made a couple songs and sent it yeah. to people, and we all got a good laugh. And I just, you know, I didn't do it every day since then. I, I think it absolutely is transformative uh, to to take a song, train a model, and have the model output things. I think. Whether it should be allowed or not because people are sensitive is a, is a good question. And maybe we need to change the rules when it comes to training models and whether the outputs should there should be some responsibility to filter them so that they are not using an artist's voice without their permission is another good question. Those are the two big things that I think should be in there. Yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag. We got one from Jason who writes, I was just listening to Friday's episode where you were talking about concerns that AI might affect human memory. It reminded me of an episode of The Pessimist Archive by Jason Pfeiffer. He said that Plato had written a dialogue in which Socrates made the argument that the new technology of writing words would cause people to rely on writing instead of their own memory. Now, this, whether this was meant to be satirical or not, I don't know. But it looks like it was at least being talked about way back in 370 BC. Yeah, yeah. And they had the Antikythera mechanism, so they had computers. Uh, well, so and all... remember, you know, remember when photography was going to, you know, oh, yeah. ruin all artists' oh, creativity? Bicycles you know, were, were, were going to, to be the ruination uh, of society, uh, you know, because people would be able to get around too fast and they would hurt themselves. Yeah, you're not so, using your legs the way, the way yeah. they were intended. And novels will just send people down into a world of fantasy and they'll never be able to deal with the real world yeah, anymore. That does happen sometimes. 
Uh, Well, folks, uh, if you'd like more of our discussions, we've got more for you. Patrons get an extended show. We call it Good Day Internet. And BioCow in our audience tipped us off to a BBC News story titled Faces Made of Living Skin Make Robots Smile. If you'd like to know more, stick around or become a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Just a reminder, you can catch our show live. We do it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow. With Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>